Okay. Um, good afternoon, Daddy. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. Um, we're going to start right away. Um, but for all of us are just some of us are just logging in. Daddy has been online for almost like 30 minutes now. Or thereabouts. So we are not going to wait for too long. Um, some of us are just joining. We'll just start and then we we'll trust that you will catch up with us on the road on the as we move on. Um well the scripture said better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. So uh, this is the last session for this uh, virtual conference and uh, those of us who has been with us from the beginning you agree with me that it's been a good one the lord has been blessing us uh it's, indeed it's been a total package from different perspective and different uh, angle uh, and the word of the lord has been coming to us um <clears throat> before uh, we pray and then we keep the ground running uh, i believe again that this evening the lord will be uh, sowing the seed of his word into our lives and uh, we trust also that um, the Lord will bless us through our uh, Father as He speaks uh, into our lives. We trust also there will be impartation of grace uh, into our life over us as He speaks. Uh, I want to remind us of a scripture. That scripture uh, came to me uh, just before we started the session. In Second Kings chapter nineteen, verse thirty and thirty-one, uh, that word was prophetically given the day Bradbinger uh, during the session that Bradbinger facilitated. Okay, uh, that word came from Brother Headward. Any some of us know him, some of us don't know him. Second Second Kings chapter nineteen, thirty thirty-one, he said, "And the remnant that is escaped out of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward." And bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem that go forth the remnant, and they that escape out of Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. So that was the word uh, that was given to us through Brother Edward. That and I believe it's a word we must hold. Okay, because I believe that God is causing us to take root downward. That's the whole essence of the the ministry of the word of God that God has been speaking into our life so that we can be people rooted, okay, so that we can be the Zion of God, you know, the Jerusalem of God that shall go forth uh, to reveal and to manifest the glory of the Lord. So I want to encourage us to open our heart, open our spirit man to receive the word of the Lord this uh, evening as the word comes. Now I'll read one more scripture. Um, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. The very popular prophecy. He said, and it shall come to pass in the last days, and you will agree with me we are in the last days, that the mountain of the lost house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many and many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord, and the word of Yahuwah from Jerusalem. So I believe again that this word is being fulfilled in our lives, in our day. The word of the Lord is coming from Zion. The Lord of God is coming from Zion, and we are. And this Zion is us. We are. That's our calling. That's our destiny. Okay. Uh, that's what our fathers have labored for. That will be this generation uh, that will 
manifest the glory of the Lord, I will speak for the word of the Lord. So uh, I will just say a short prayer and that, and then I will ask Daddy to come um, online. Okay, Brad Benga, can you hear me? Brad Benga. Hello? Brad Benga, can you hear me? It's like, uh, I'm not sure you can. Okay. So let's pray. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask him to pray, but since he can't hear me, we just pray and I will pray. Lord, we just thank you uh, for this session. Thank you that you have been with us from the beginning of this virtual conference. You've been sowing the seed of your work to our lives. And Lord, we are grateful. Thank you for fathers, um, brothers and sisters who have ministered to us the one way or the other. Thank you. We are grateful for your mercy. Uh, over us. Thank you for speaking your word to us at such a time as this. Thank you for not leaving us in darkness. Lord, ah, we are grateful. We know it's not because we are better than others who do not have this privilege. But it has pleased you to show us your mercy. And Lord, we are grateful. And we humble ourselves again before you as your word comes to us. Acknowledging our help, our weakness and our helplessness without you. We trust you, Lord, that you will help us, that you will help us. Holy Spirit, we trust in you, that you will brew over us again, that you, your breath will come upon us, that you will brew over the world, and you will breathe over the world that has been sown, and one that will be sown again in our life, in our heart, that this world will join in it, that this world will bring forth fruit. But Lord, not only those of us who are logged into this virtual meeting, but Lord, the creation around us, the things that are invisible to the, to the to the physical eye, that they will hear your word, oh Lord, they will and they will begin to respond to your word. The heavens over us, the constellation over us, the head beneath us, the water underneath the head, they will begin to hear your word and they will begin to respond. Lord, to your word, because we know that the time for Zion in Africa to arise has come. It's time for your sons and your daughter to arise has come. The time for you to get your remnant, your army that will take root downward and bear fruit upward in Africa and from Africa has come. And Lord, we bless you that uh, you are doing this by your spirit. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you will take control as the word of the Lord come to us, that it will come with power, it will come with strength, it will pierce our heart, it will set us on our feet. Lord, to rise up out of this place to begin to walk with you. To begin to to begin to align ourselves, Lord, with you. To begin to give ourselves as a total, complete offering to you, Lord, to serve you in this. To be that Zion that you have spoken about. Lord, we bless you. Once again, we take authority over the airwave, the gadget, the devices that we need that they will align, Lord, with your word. There will not be any distraction. There will not be any manipulation. In the head, that your word will have a free flow and a free cost to our heart. We bless you and we thank you. We give you all the praise. In the name of Yahusha, the Messiah, we are praying. Amen. Amen. Can we all hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, so, Daddy, thank you once again for your time. Uh, we appreciate you for, for your support and your love. You've been there for us as a father. And we thank you for um, that support and covering that we have enjoyed uh, in our relationship with you. Uh, we trust that the Lord will bless us again as um, we bring the word of the Lord to us in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. So you, mm. you, you have the floor, sir. And, Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you and uh, welcome everyone to so this last uh, meeting. Uh, it's been a very fruitful time. 
I'm glad I have been part of almost all the meetings. The one I did not, I wasn't part of is because I was otherwise busy, uh, maybe ministering somewhere else. But I also have time to uh, begin to listen to the ones that I, I wasn't present to be part of. So I want to thank God for all those who have ministered to us, and I'm asking the Lord to bless them. I want to thank God for all of us who have been part of this meeting. Uh, I know some parents are here. Uh, I know some very young people are here. And so I know that younger adults are here. So I know it's a very big audience. And uh, so and I trust that the Lord is uh, blessing all of us at our various levels. Uh, our um, parents, young ones, young adults. I trust the Lord is sowing the seed of the word. The theme this year, like we all know, is Arise and Shine for Your Light is Come. Very, very appropriate. Um, I was listening to, I think, what being that said it's not Arise to do something, but Arise to be something. To be something what God wants us to be. To Arise to be what God wants us to be. And I think, I, I think that's very apt. Listen to the issue of leadership um, and so many other that has been spoken to us. And I do sincerely pray that the, the Lord of the world will watch over the world. Uh, let me go straight away uh, to what I have. I began my, the first meeting uh, that I led or that I, where I shared, I spoke from uh, the book of uh, Malachi, uh, the last book in the Old Testament. And I began by sharing the controversy of uh, God with his people at that day. Uh, so I'm going to continue from there, and I'm going to uh, take, uh, go further. So please come with me as we go back to the book of Malachi. Please be ready. I'm going to read some uh, scriptures today. Um, so be ready, and I hope you are with your your Bible, so that we can look at what is good when the Word of God is, is called, that we look at it. It has its own uh, blessing and impartation, and so we can uh, both see and hear. Um, so I want to read from chapter 1, uh, verse 6. And the, the Lord was asking a question. You see, a son honored his father, his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Say the Lord of hosts, the Yeshua. O oh, you priests, unto you priests that despise my name, and ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Uh, that's uh, what I've read. In other words, God is saying, God is speaking to his people, and I think it's even very, very interesting that God was talking to the priests first and foremost. Why? Uh, because uh, as priests, they are custodians of the oracles of God. What well, you will see there that uh, it's saying that uh, in verse uh, five is talking that is is colonized with the priests and people who seek the law from the mouth of the priests. They should seek answer from the mouth of the priests, and therefore, no wonder God was speaking to the priests first and foremost. And uh, I like to say or remind us that we are all priests, the New Testament priests, according to First Peter. A royal priesthood in the book of Revelation, it says, Made all kings and priests unto him. And uh, I believe that that's our calling, that's what God is also as calling us to arise into to be priests. Uh, and all that God has given to us to be priests and the marketplace. This uh, is the, the mandate of the law that you and I will be his priests in the marketplace. Whatever you are doing, your career, and your profession, whatever, where that God wants to be his priest. Um, and the particularly to be priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
the order in which our Lord also was uh, ordained as a priest. Not after the priesthood of uh, Aaron, not the Aaronic priesthood or Levitical priesthood, but the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. We are told uh, that in that Hebrews that uh, this priesthood will carry the power of endless life and that this priesthood will carry the power of the age to come. Uh, it's a great hope. That's what we're being called to arise into, to arise to become a priest, all of us individually, in your place of work, even in your home. A father is to be a priest in his home over his children and wife. A mother is to be a priest in the home. Okay, I use the word priest. I'm, I, I'm not saying priestess. Uh, I'm, different, I'm deliberately using that word. So we are called to be to function as priests for our God. Now, again, so the question God is asking the priest is, well, if I am your father, where's my? I go back. He said, uh, he said, father honor it. A son honor it, his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Okay, I mentioned this in the, the first time I spoke to you on this platform, that God was concerned about his name. Priesthood is to carry his name. And uh, he said to the, in number, he said, you shall put my name upon my people. So the priest is to carry his name and to be able to place that name upon others. So if there's anybody who should honor that name, it should be his priest. Because indeed, it's their currency. If they are reason for being, the, being called, if they are reason for uh, being given the opportunity to serve him. So he was concerned about his name. The honor they attached to his, his name and the respect they attached to his name. Again, that what we have read also reveals the fact that God does not just want them to be priests, but he wants to be sons. I've always shared that uh, it takes sons to be true priests. God is God of relationship. God is God of relationship. And you will find that the attitude that these people display in the book of Malachi is that they wanted employment, not sonship. God was offering them relationship, fatherhood, sonship, relationship. But they wanted to relate to God as somebody who is under his employment. Pay me. That's why they will say to God, like I show to you, they are, the way is this. God, if I'm going to serve you, what are you going to pay me? That's what the Lord was saying to them. They will not even open the door. The tabernacle would ask him, what is in it for them? They will not kindle fire upon the altar with us and what is in it, but then you will see that in first in first ten. God doesn't use higher names. God is looking for sons. It's a family matter. It's a family matter. It is not an employment. It is not a job. It is not a, just an assignment. You will see that uh, when the Lord, uh, the Father, was introduced to John at the baptism of John, he said, "Here's my son." I'm sending him as my son, not as, uh, not as a worker. Okay, and uh, I want to say that clearly, that the call today is for you and I to arise to be true sons, to serve him in whatever capacity that he has called us. And if we are going to be sons, there are things we need to know. There are things, discipline, training, experiences, preparation, to be first and foremost his sons and daughters. So, but we must not do like the people of this day, who will treat relationship for something lower than relationship. It's good to have career. It's good to uh, have visions, but as what? 
as a hireling, or as a worker, or as an employee, or as a son. That is the message of the kingdom. The whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons. So the challenge for me and for you is to pay the price of sonship, which the Lord paid, so that we can be all that God wants us to be. Indeed, the scripture said that popular scripture, the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the source of God. And so the challenge before us is to do that. So God is demanding for a relationship. And God is demanding that within this relationship there should be honor, there should be a respect, that we should honor him. Our life should honor him. What we do should honor him. Honor his name. Honor his name. Honor his altar. And therefore, I want to speak about a little bit about altar. You can't have priesthood without having an altar. The two are inseparable. Okay? What is altar? Simply put, altar is a life of consecration, a life of found to God, a place of meeting with God. And what God wants us to do is that my life should become an altar a perpetual altar for God. Uh, that's what's at first very, very important. When the scripture says the glory of God shall rest upon you, it's talking that you become an altar, a moving altar, a mobile altar, that wherever you go, you become his altar. Because as we go to the marketplace, there are altars contending, <laughs> and that will contend. It will depend on what altar you are made of and from which altar are you coming from. Wherever you go, there are always altars. Okay. And that's why you find that uh, the Lord himself consecrated himself. And so a life of consecration. And I always say that before you can raise even physical altar, you must be an altar for some more. That's the New Testament understanding of being an altar. You must be an altar. The, the scripture says in the book of uh, Hebrews that our Lord himself consecrated himself as son forever. He offered up himself. So it's a person who has fully offered up himself to his best ability at whatever stage he is that is truly, truly understanding the message of the kingdom. It's to become an altar, to be so consecrated, to be so offered to God that God can rest his glory upon you. know. Fire will always be upon the altar. Many people want God's fire, but they don't want to be an altar. It takes somebody who has become an altar for the, for the fire to rest. You are that sacrifice so that the fire can rest. God is not talking about physical temple today. He's talking about spiritual temple. We all know that. So for the glory of God to rest upon me, for the fire of God to rest upon me, uh, I mean, I must be an altar. A son that his life is laid down upon the altar. We will see this principle whether in the Old Testament. In fact, the scriptures say in the book of Hebrews, there's an altar. There's an altar before God where we eat, where others who serve the table cannot come. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm making that very clear so that we can see what is in the heart of God for us. That in all that we have heard from this meeting, as we go back, the challenge is to be a consecrated vessel for body who has offered himself and is offering himself. It's a daily offering because he said the fire must not go out of the altar. The fire must always be there. Altar is a place of communion. And I'm reading that scripture in um, Hebrews chapter 13. You see, we have an altar. Hebrews 13 verse 10. We have an altar. Wherefore, they have no right to eat we serve the tabernacle, okay? We have an altar. What altar? An altar before God. An altar we go. We become an altar. To go to God's altar, we must be an altar, okay? Deep must call on to deep. And they say altar is a place of feeding. And then they say some people are bad. Some people are, will not be allowed to come to this altar. Why? Because they serve the table. They delight in serving tables. Uh, you will see this concept also in uh, Ezekiel. You will see that he said, the son of Sadok, they will come near to me. They will minister to me. He said, but the priest who served the table, who served 
uh, uh, the people, they will not come near to me. I will not allow them to come to me. So we begin to see the difference in priesthood. If uh, my uh, consideration, my focus is to serve without being an altar, to run as a table, to serve people, run around without a life of intimacy with God. That's God's complaint with the people. Now, I want to go and read, like I said to you, I will be reading uh, scriptures here and there, and I ask you to just please uh, grant me this indulgence to keep uh, bringing this scripture before us again and again. Because my desire is that after this meeting, that something will change, there will be a shift, and that we'll be able to begin to affect our society we we'll begin to affect our communities, we we'll begin to affect the place of our assignments, our offices, wherever we go, we we'll become a perpetual altar unto God. I'm reading from uh, Ezekiel, and I'm just, I'm going to be reading from Ezekiel 44. And we are very familiar. He says, I just want to read there. I said, Verse 10, Ezekiel 44, verse 10, and the livers that are gone away from me, when Israel went astray, we went astray away from me, away from me, no relationship, no intimacy, no connection. After their, and they away from me, after their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. Yea, they shall be ministers in my sanctuary. Having charge at the gates of the house and ministering to the house, they shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifices for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister to them, minister to the people. Because they minister unto them before their idols and cause the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Therefore, have I lifted all my hand against them, said the Lord God and they shall bear their iniquity, and they shall not come near unto me. What a life. What a life. Not to be so full of activities and running up and running down, but never being able to come close and come near to God. To do the office of a priest in, in, unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place. For they shall bear their shame and their abomination which they have committed. I want us to note that he said that this, this, this priest or this minister or this whoever, the, how do we are describe them ago, certainly they will be in part of the house. Uh, certainly they will be somewhere in the house, but they will not come to the most holy place. And the priesthood that we deal with the nations, the priesthood that will take nations it's not priesthood who minister in the outer court or the middle court. It's the priesthood that minister in the most holy place. Like I said, I'm, now I'm talking to young people, but I, I choose to deposit these things in your heart. I choose to speak this into your heart so that somewhere this seed will begin to take root. And, uh, and trust in the Lord. Because often, uh, if we don't say, say these things and we wait until you are grown up before we begin, then it may be too late. They say, cash them young. Cash them young. I hope that we are doing so. I hope that we are catching you young. So we see that we need to decide where do you want, where we want to be. And then let's go to verse 15. But the priest delivers the sons of Sado that kept the charge of my sanctuary. When the children of Israel went astray for me, they shall come near to me to minister to me. And they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat that's praise and worship and the blood. See, the Lord that's offering their souls because the life of the flesh, the life of the soul is in the blood. They shall enter into my sanctuary and they shall come near unto my table to minister unto me and they shall keep my charge. Okay? Joining into sonship is the offering of the blood, is the offering of our life. Is the offering of the soul. The life of the soul is in the flesh. Nobody grows into sonship. Nobody grows into his priesthood. Nobody can come to God and be in the holy place who has not offered his soul to the Lord. In a very clear, effective manner. 
And I'm saying this deliberately. We can understand it say, so much about the salvation of the soul, but not pay the price. That's why the Lord was saying to them, you bring the offering to me, you bring the, you bring the lame, the blind, the weak, you offer that to me. And that's what the Lord is saying. When we do not offer, the, the sweet smelling savor is that when a man offers his soul to God. And so it's, it's also important, I'll get to that later. Let me continue to go on. Verse 17, and it shall come to pass that when they enter into the gates of the inner court, city, the Holy of Holy, they shall be clothed with linen garments, and no wool shall come upon them whilst they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. So this is this is the it. If you go back to uh, uh, Ezekiel 43, that's the house is described. When it says, show the house to the house, show them where they have built my altar or my house, and it says, show them, and it's still talking about this house. The scripture will know in the last day that there's a, a, a mountain above every other mountain. That's what we call Zion. The Holy of Holies is truly Mosiah. The Holy of Holies is Mosiah. It is the priesthood that have journeyed from the outer court to the to the middle court to the most holy place. That is Zion. That is Zion. That's where sonship is made real, is in the most holy place. It is good that we begin from the outer court, outer court. It's good that we go to the holy place, the second cut, but it's important that we know that the journey is to the most holy place. And if any ministry is not saying this to us, they are not preparing us for our day, they are not preparing us for things that are coming. Things are coming. And it is only those who have journeyed to the most holy place, as sons and priests to the most holy God, that will escape the things that are coming. Okay? That's why if you go to Revelation chapter 11, you say, cut it off. Cut off the, the, the outer cord. Cut off the middle cord. Let it be trampled under feet. But where we go preserve in this last day is only going to preserve the most holy place. The sons who are journey. The sons who are crowned with oil. Okay? That's what the Lord said. He has made us kings and priests. We see this example everywhere in the scripture as we go. So, you see... This is the challenge of our day. This is what we have, must be told, we must be taught, it must be our song, it must be our dream, it must be our teaching, it must be everything, particularly for us. And I want to say this, um, you know, for us Africans, if the Lord is saying this is the time for Africa, <laughs> it means we need to work, we need to understand. We can't keep saying this time for Africa and we do nothing about it, and we just remain the same way we are. There must be a change, there must be a difference. You see, God will not give Africa to us if we are not, you know, where we ought to be when the sonship. But it begins from where you are. It begins from your, your street. And you possess, take over your street for God and govern for God there in your priesthood and kingship. And you take even your home. Can I take my street? Can I take my neighborhood? Can I take my town? Can I take my street? Can I take my village? Can I take my city? These are the challenges. If God is going to give us the nations, it must start somewhere. It must start somewhere. It must start somewhere. So I believe this is the argument. Let me go back to uh, uh, the book of uh, Malachi where we, we started. I see, think we need to go there before we just uh, keep moving on. But I hope I've been able to show us what when the Lord say, arise and shine, or your light is come. Light is first and foremost truth. Arise and shine. Take the truth. If you and I were going to shine, we must, we must, we must know the truth. We must uh, bury ourselves in the truth. We must have hunger for the truth. We must allow the truth of God to permit us. We must have a hunger, a very big hunger for the truth of the word of God. Okay? This is important. You know? And we, we, we can't arise and shine. The word of God is, is, is the light. The word of God is the light, and it's the amount of the word of God I have that determines the amount of the light that I have. The amount of the light that I have will determine how I shine. I rise and shine, for your light is come. So God is offering us his, this priesthood place, priesthood after the other makes it. But it can only come out of relationship. That's why I say, I want to be a father to you. And if I'm a father, where's my honor? Where's my respect? 
And like I said, the life of a priest is to honor him and to give him honor and respect. I can't live a life that does not honor God and I say I'm, I'm his priest. There's a price for that. And I want to go forward and I want to read uh, uh, Malachi again, chapter 3. And uh, God is controversy with these people. Uh, in uh, chapter 3 of Malachi, and I think verse 7, he says, he's saying to them again, see, even from the days of your father, he have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. Okay, what are the ordinances? So the Lord is saying, even from the days of your fathers, God wanted to be, God was offering to be their father. And then he was saying, even the days of your father, in other words, he was saying to this generation that he was addressing to this uh, prophet, uh, prophet uh, Malachi, he was saying to them, you're backsliding, you're going astray, starting from the days of your fathers. And that's why the issue of God being our father and we having true fathers are very, very important. Okay? God was offering them. But then he's saying to them, what we are doing now, it can be traced back to your fathers. Your father went away from me, went astray from me. So there's no, it's no surprise that you also you are, you are going astray from me. One of the things that is a big hindrance that the enemy uses to keep us away from walking in the truth is because if we do not deal with wrong examples, wrong patterns, you will see this. Uh, Ezekiel was also saying this in, I think, in the Ezekiel 43. He said you should forget the carcasses of your kings. There are kings that have laid uh, wrong patterns, wrong lifestyle, wrong ways for them. If we do not deal with that, we can never arise and shine. Okay? If we don't deal with that, and many of us, where we are tied down and we are not able to rise, because we are still attached, string attached, we are still bogged down by the ways that people have taught us that is not the way of the Lord. And that's why in this last day, we have to forbid a lot of things that we have been taught that is not the word of God. The time has come. I remember when I was leaving the denomination, I was going, the Lord, the Father said to me, go home, go home. You need to forbid the things you have been taught that is not my word. Half truths. And half truths are half lies. That you have been taught that is not, you can't mix it, you can't mingle the two together. You can't add the old and the new. It's not possible. The new and the one. The new word, the pure word of the Lord. There's no point being fed with trash. You can't be fed with trash and you arise to become a son. It's not possible. Okay? That's why we must be choosing what we, we eat, where we feed. Who feed? Who gives us food? Who gives us the word of God? Are we being fed at Jezebel's table? Are we being fed by Balaam? Are we being fed by people who do not speak to us? Who who will pamper our flesh and tell us what we want to hear. Remember the scripture saying, in our day, people will not have a desire for the truth. They will have itching ears. They would like to hear what people, and that's why many of us, that we want to rise into sonship, where we are feeding with uh, trash, motivational speakings. They sound good, they sound motivating, they excite us, they tickle us, but they take us nowhere in our journey okay and we have to settle that once and for all we have to be discerning in the natural you can't see somebody who just eat anything he's junk and everything he is everything and then he will grow he will have a proper body a healthy body it's not possible so how much more what i allow people to feed me with what are we feeding up who is feeding us where are we eating where's our altar that's why i read that scripture we have an altar that those who serve the book cannot come to feed. There's a place in God that if you are not ready, you can't get there to be fed. God serves his food to those who have offered themselves fully, totally, completely. The days are gone that we should be, if we really want to grow, okay? Uh, the Jeremiah said that they should separate the pressure from the profane. 
The scripture also that the priest, the work of the priest is to teach us the difference between that which is holy and that which is not holy. In this last day, to arise and shine, we must determine, we must be determined that we are not going to feed on trash. We're not going to just eat anything. Nobody is just going to serve us and we just eat in the name of what? But I, I must say a lot of us are still doing that. It's so cheap today. Preaching is on the television 24 hours. It's full in our, in, our, in our phone, and I'm not saying don't listen, but I'm just saying if truly you are a son, you will discern, you will have a discernment what you eat and what you don't eat. You will discern what you listen to and what you don't. Because something sounds good, it's not enough. Because something, uh, you know, gives you one, two, three, four steps to make money, to be this and that. Yeah, it may be good for the now. It may give you temporary excitement or temporary resource. But we are, we are talking about eternal things. We are talking about sonship. We are talking about rising so that the glory of the Lord can rise upon you. That's what we're talking about. Talking about. And uh, for me, for me, I, I, I just want to read that scripture again. Please come with me to the book of Ezekiel. And I, I just want to, what is the job of a, a priest? Uh, let's go back to that Ezekiel that we, have, we read from. Ezekiel 44. And I want you to Ezekiel 44. And uh, I just want to, it says in verse 23, in verse 23, the true priesthood, the priesthood after uh, the, after the order of uh, Sadok or Melchizedek. I can't go into that. I will have broken that also. But Sadok means righteousness. If you go and trace the history of Sadok, you will see that they are pre ah, the, it's a priesthood that stood for righteousness, for holiness, for, you know, you remember Phineas. When, when the children of Israel went after, after the Baal and they were committing fornication and somebody walking and naked with a, with a prostitute to the camp, Phineas went and hacked him down and hacked down the woman. Today, I'm not saying you should take a physical sword and hack people down. That's not what I'm saying. But I say we must carry the sword of the Spirit. We must carry the sword of the Word of God. We must defend the holiness of God. And so Phineas went and did that. Phineas is of the stock. And that God, God spoke to him. You will not lack anyone. You will not lack a man to stand before me. So Sadok was one of the, uh, is from that, is from that lineage. It's from, it's from Phineas. So let's see what it says. And I'm reading from that uh, Ezekiel 44 first. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane and cause them to discern between unclean and the clean. That is true priesthood that we must serve. The people of God should be able to discern what is holy and what is not holy, what is profane and what is not. What do we do? As you, as, as you grow in your sonship, as you grow in your priesthood, you begin to be, become very discerning in what you listen to, what you hear, the music you hear, the word you hear, the preaching you hear, the teaching you hear. Because somebody says Jesus doesn't mean he's preaching the truth. Wholesome food is important. So that's why I'm going to go back to that book of uh, Malachi. So he said to them, you have gone astray from the days of your father. And the seeker said, cast away the carcasses of your kings. If we don't cast away the carcasses of our king, I thank God uh, for men and women who are preaching the word and speaking the word, but we have just to be discerning. And well, like I said to you, I, I needed to formate a lot of things when I came out of the system. I needed to formate a lot of things that is not true. And, and, and I'm, I'm glad. And the Lord said to me, if you don't pass through that process of purging and cleansing, you will not be able to do what I call you to do. And I had to stay home. And it was not easy. And it was not easy. It was not the same thing he was saying to Isaiah when he said to Isaiah, Isaiah said, I am unclean, I am I dwell among unclean people. It's about me, it's not about anybody. I've been among unclean people, and God had to put Isaiah. And then he said to Isaiah, Then go, now go, now go and seek what my holy seed, my holy seed. God is looking for his holy seed. Arise and shine for the holy seed. For those who arise and become what God wants us to be in this last day, it will be his holy seed. I want to take you again. You will see, please, I want to read uh, Acts chapter 7. I'm still talking about our fathers. Before I, I want to go and read Acts 7. Please come with me. Acts chapter 7. And I want to pick uh, how important it is for us. I think it's what uh, 
is what uh, um, <clears throat> 51 and 52, Acts 7. I think it's what Stephen says somewhere. Acts 51, Acts 7, Acts chapter 7, verse 51 and 52. Say, Ye stiff necked and not circumcised in heart and ears, do you always resist the Holy Ghost as your father did? So do ye. Eh? As your father did, so do ye. Will you always resist the Holy Ghost uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in their ears? Okay, which of the fathers started to which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain them? We should before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. And of course, this one didn't stop them killing Stephen, and yet they killed Stephen in the name of God. They kill Stephen in the name of God. What am I saying? If our fathers have taught us wrongly and we are not delivered from what they've taught us, we'll do exactly what they did. We'll do exactly what they did. So that's God's controversy with them. Is that where you've gone astray from me the day of your father? This is the same thing that uh, Stephen is saying here. You have not always done this. It's the way of your fathers. Okay? Have only that. I want to move on. And, and I want to go back. So I want to go back to the book of Malachi. Please come with me again to the book of Malachi. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to the last chapter of the book of Malachi. Chapter 4. And in chapter 4, it says verse 4, and uh, verse 5, and verse 6. I want to read it together. Remember ye the Lord of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their father, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, we've talked about not following the ways of our father who rebelled against or who resisted God, who resisted the Holy Ghost, who went astray. But also here we have been told to that God, one of the things that God is going to do in our day in this last day is that he will turn the heart of the father, the true fathers, he will turn their hearts to their children. And he will turn the heart of true children, true sons and daughters to their fathers. Lest the Lord will come and smite them. So we have to make the difference here. And God make the difference here. Okay? Now, I, I like you to see, and I want to say this thing like, like this. I've said earlier that the generation in the book of Malachi, they, they had an attitude. The attitude is what is in it for me. Okay? They said to serve God is a, is, is, is a bother. Uh, to serve God is Bahala. This demand are too much. <laughs> That's what they say. But for a true son, there's no demand that God makes from him that is too much. In fact, it's his joy to serve his father, to obey his father. When you see people grumbling, oh, this is too much. This is too hard. Is it, is it not too hard? Is it not this, too small? Is it not? Ah. It shows that something is wrong somewhere. Maybe they need to check their background. They need to check. They need to check where they are coming from. They need to go back to what they have been taught. Maybe they have been taught that serving God is ease. Just go, there's no, no, no. Don't tell me deep things. Just tell me, tell me. You, have, you need to go back to your father. Because true sons want to obey their fathers. That's, that's the mark. A son can do nothing but what he sees the father doing. A true son, whatever God makes the demand, it may be difficult, it may be hard, but we say, Father, that's what I want to do. I know it's hard, but give me. And like the Lord pray in the garden, Father, if it's possible to take this cup away, but not my will, but your will. That's the cry of a son. Not my will. Not my will, but your will. Okay? Because sometimes this relationship with the Father, it will demand of us something that I have. He demanded from, uh, he demanded from Abraham to lay down Isaac. And Isaac demonstrated sonship. Isaac didn't fight his father. That's one shit. God the Father was asking Abraham to do the most difficult thing. 
And yet, Isaac, in response to his father, who was obeying his father, surrendered to his father. Yielded to his father. Isaac is a, is a, is a, is a, is a picture, it's a pattern of true sonship. That's why you see, Isaac did not start another well. He started the well of his father. He, he rebuilt the well of his father. If son does not have a different revelation from his father, if son does not have a different vision from his father, it's just the same. Just the same. God is not a, a God of too many visions. God is a God of one vision. God is God of one vision. Okay, if you see a son who says he has a different vision from his father, it is not true. Okay, it's not true. At least from the word of God. From what I see. So he's saying that he will turn the heart of the children, out of the father to the children. So deep will begin to call on to deep. If you are growing your sonship, something will look, something in you will look for fathers. You don't have to be preached to. You don't have to be forced. You don't have to go because something in you. That's what happened to me. That's what happened to me. I was in the ministry. I was I was doing well in the ministry as a young person. I was uh, seeing results in the ministry. In fact, before I left, they were already considering me for a higher leadership. People were already saying that this young man, the way he's going, one day will become our like you. They were already saying that. But, but deep down in my heart, I was looking for something. The ministry was not my, yes, I saw ministry, I saw promotion. I was in the ministry for only about three or four years thereabout. They already, somebody had already put down my name to be ordained as a reference. To be ordained as a reference, my denomination there was a, a place of honor, high honor, you consider. And I've only done three years. And there were people who have been there before me 17 years, 15 years, they have not been ordained as reference. And yet I just came three years, they ordained me as reference. And I didn't apply for it. And I said, I didn't apply. I don't want to be a reference. I'm just a young man. I'm just three years old. Why do you want to give me reference? I don't want it. Even at all, let me wait. wait. And they said, no, somebody has applied for you. Somebody has put down your name and it's already, I don't put the man who did that for you to shame. I said, okay, I wouldn't like to put the, the man who did for me for shame. So I decided to accept. But down deep in my heart, that was not my passion. That was not my goal. That's not what I was looking for. Something in me say, you need something deeper. Something in me say, you need somebody you can sit at his feet. Something in me was saying, you, there's something more. You need to look for somebody you can sit at his feet, who can teach you, who can lead you. And that's, and that's what drove me to, to go to sleep. I prayed that prayer for, for months, if not for a whole year, before the Lord led me to go and see him. I never met him before I've heard from him. So I'm saying this because I want to break this thing down. Today, there are many teaching fathers. Some people are even rejecting fathers and say there's nothing like that. It only, it's only shows where they are coming from. A true son wants to be fathered. Not only by God the Father, he wants also to want to. That's what this scripture is saying, to turn the heart of the fathers to the children. To turn the heart of the father. And it is true. By the time I went to Pilatin and I spoke to him and I shared, he said, what is it that the Lord is saying to you? I said, the Lord is saying to me to come to you. He said, for what? I said, the Lord has been speaking to me, deep things. And I want to, and the Lord said, I should come. You, are, you will explain them to me. You will teach me. And he said, oh, God has the audacity to tell you this. And that what began our relationship. It's a hunger. It's a hunger. The greatest thing God can give you in life, hunger for God. Hunger for God. Hunger. To know what the Father has spoken, the true fathers, to read their books, to follow them, to see what they said, how God led them, how God spoke to them, what God did in their lives, to see how they finished. The scripture says, follow them who through faith and righteousness have inherited the promises. That's Hebrews chapter 6. So follow them who through faith and patience, perseverance, inher what promises have they inherited? Fathers are those who have inherited certain promises of God, and they can pass it down to us. I can give you an example. In the book, uh, there is the, uh, one of the promises that was given to the Lord Jesus Christ is that he will, his hand will be upon the sea and upon the rivers. That's one of the promises that was given to him. Who inherited that promise? David inherited that promise. He inherited, you will see that in Psalm 89. He inherited that promise. And then David gave that promise to Solomon. Unfortunately, Solomon didn't follow through. Unfortunately, Solomon didn't follow through. But, but, but his father, 
the father, David, inherited promises for him. And it was supposed to, because when inheritance is passed on to you, you must build upon it. Unfortunately, Solomon didn't, didn't hold that inheritance. So what I'm saying, father has those who have inherited certain promises, certain promises, certain promises, through faith and their perseverance, through faith and their, they have inherited certain promises. And they are ready to give these promises that they have inherited to their sons. That's what he said. So please look at that's why when the law was to come the first time, he the spirit of Elijah rested on, on John the Baptist to prepare the way of the Lord, to prepare people for God. We can go into other, but time will not allow me to prepare people for God. Why was it? Have you asked the question? Why was it that the spirit of Elijah that came and the mantle of Elijah that came upon John the Baptist? Therefore, John was a continuation of Elijah. And I'm going to speak on that shortly. Okay? John the Baptist was a continuation of uh, Elijah to prepare the way of the Lord. And that's one of the things the Lord said to me many years ago while I was in denomination. He said, the spirit of Elijah will soon rest of people to call people back from idolatry, call them out of system, call them back to me. That's the will of God. May I say to you, God does not manufacture new, new mantles. I am doing that. I'm going through that study. God does not manufacture new mantles. He gives the old mantles. God doesn't create new mantles. He gives the old. And I began to look at this. I can tell you that even the Lord is the continuation of Adam. Because the, the assignment God gave to Adam, that's why the Lord himself was called the second Adam. And I'm going to show you some scripture in that direction. But let me just say. So the heart of the hunger in the heart of sons and daughters to seek their father and the heart of the father to seek son. That's one of the things I tell people these days. And, and, I, and I say, please, if you don't want to be raised as a son, I am called to raise sons. I'm not called to, to just be engaged in ministry. I'm not called to do it. I want to, the, 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 the grace God gives to me is to raise sons for him. And I don't want to waste my time for somebody who's not ready to be raised as a son. Okay, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Paul was talking, he's talking about Timothy. He said, as a son, you have known my faith, you have known my doctrine, you have known my, you have fully known my way, my doctrine, my suffering. That's a son, father-son relationship. It's God gives you a father, you want to know his ways, his charity, his faith, his doctrine, his suffering. You want to know everything about him. You want to fully know. And I'm saying this because also even for us, I do sometimes say it's my father, but there's no relationship. There's no intimacy. You know, you see that uh, Paul, Paul who taught that nobody should circumcise anybody, which it was true. That's the truth. When it comes to doctrinal standard, the, to be circumcised is not a condition to be saved. It's no, con it's no longer a condition to be saved. To be saved is to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Yeshua as your Lord and your Savior, and you shall be saved. But when it came to being raised as a son to fulfill his ministry, Paul had to circumcise uh, Timothy. In that scripture, he said Timothy was, uh, uh, that his father was uh, a Greek. He was mentioned twice. It's possible that Timothy was not properly lived. He did not have the privilege to be raised by his father. Even though Timothy was already a believer and was already a disciple. But then he took Paul to now make him a son, to raise him for God as son. And please imagine that Paul took the knife and circumcised an adult. Ha, that's sonship, that's sonship, that's fatherhood. To be circumcised, imagine, it means nakedness. It means he was completely naked before Paul. Paul was an adult. It means that that, that, that circumcision brought pain to him. And that's, that's fatherhood. As the father with, 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 with the, the heart is a, is a heart relationship. The father will know you intimately. The father, you can't circumcise somebody that you don't know intimately. You can't help them. You can't apply the knife. Like God said to, to Joshua, circumcise them because they're about to enter into the land of inheritance. Nobody enters into the land of inheritance without being circumcised. Nobody. Nobody fulfills his purpose and ministry without being circumcised by somebody. So the question, who is circumcising me? Who is circumcising you? Whom are you close to enough that he can apply the knife, the sharp knife to you, to your most intimate parts, to the things that are secret to you? Who do you open up to so that the person can have the privilege to circumcise you? I don't want us to live a lie. 
to claim something, to you know, you know, just chanting something, uh, Father, 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 without living the life. And I think many of us are doing this. We are doing so. We are doing so. And it's a lie. And it's a deception. You know, to say things you are not. Just because it's a dropping that is taught. It's a relationship. So Timothy was close enough that, that, that Paul could circumcise him. It means nakedness, openness, transparency, no thing, nothing hidden. This message is not popular, but that's the way to the kingdom. That's the way to dominion. That's the way to be sons. That's the way to arise and shine that God is speaking to us. You do not happen. You must be a continuation of something. Okay. Many people today, they don't want a relationship that will expose their hidden parts. They don't want a relationship that will expose what they are doing, their heart, their flesh. They want it to cover. And, and then we are getting to the deception. Just, just come to a church, cover yourself. Don't, your life is not touched. You live the same way you want to live. You go the same way you want to go. Your life is not touched. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Nobody who is circumcising you. Who is writing to you? Uh, John say, I write unto you. I write unto you, children. I write unto you, young men. I write unto you, father. Who is writing to you? The counsel of God. The purpose of God. Uh, Paul said, you are my epistle written. Paul took it for that. It's not just writing to you, but who is writing upon you? Who's making you an epistle? It is one thing to, to read the epistle. It's one thing to become an epistle. Who's writing you? Who's writing on you? Eternal counsel of God. and make you an epistle to be read. You need to become an epistle to be read. I need to become an epistle to be read. But somebody must write upon you. Somebody must circumcise us. Somebody must touch us. This is through sonship. So the heart of the fathers, the children. Okay. I, I have taught this again because my time is going. You will see that even in the case of Elijah and Elisha, Elisha was more interested in becoming a prophet rather than becoming a son or a father. I have taught this before. Elisha saw it late. It was too late. That's why Elijah asked him. Elijah asked him, if you, he said, give me the double portion. He said, well, it's, your body asked him, but if you see me, and what did he say? He said, my father, my father. He that too, he has always been seeing him just a prophet. Uh, Elisha was more interested in taking the prophetic mantle, not the heart of a father. And we see that when he took the mantle and came back, and some people were, some young people were making mockery of him. What did he say? He asked, it, <laughs> he asked a wild animal to eat them up. That is not very fatherly, isn't it? Many of us, we are striving to be the best apostle, the best prophet, the best uh, teacher, the best pastor, the best evangelist. That's not the goal of the kingdom. The best is to be the, the son who obeys the father, who follows the father, uh, who has uh, who, the heavenly father. There's two legs. The heavenly father, your relationship with the heavenly father is intact, is intimate, is fresh, is holy. And yet you have fathers over you who can teach you, who can circumcise you on his behalf. That's why he said, lest I come to smite the earth with a curse. Personal work is to raise sons. All the ministries that they are to raise sons, they are not just to raise members. They are not even just to raise uh, disciples. They are to raise sons. You are a, a believer. You, you are raised. You are you you are you brought you are brought into faith. You become a believer. You you become a mature believer. You are raised as an uh, as a disciple. Then you are raised as a son. Then you become a father. It is all about family. It's about generational thing. The call of God, the purpose of God, is about generational things and transgenerational things. That's what, it's a family. That's why the scripture says that the church is a family. But we have made it to be a higher lane. Serve me, you serve you, I hire you, you hire me, I fire you, fire me. It's no longer a family. We need to record, re rediscover this. It's a family. That's what he's saying to them in the book of Malachi. I, if I am your father, and I want to be your father, where's my home? Where's my fear? Okay. I read in a book many years ago, and uh, the man said, me, many people, many people today, they don't want father, they want pastors. That's the being, that's the problem of our day. We just want. I want to recommend a book to you. Uh, I, Lola, I, I don't know if they can see this book. Uh, it says, uh, the book is, you have, you have not many fathers. Uh, I want to, 
if you can be displayed. And I, I would recommend that they, they buy they, anybody who can lead their hands. And the man one in this book, he said, well, this, the message in this book is not easy, but it's difficult, but it's a message for the kingdom. It's a message for today. Uh, the title of the book is a, You Have Not Many Fathers. It's written by Dr. Mark Hamby. Mark Hamby, H-A-N-B-Y. If you can lay your hands on it, it will be a good, good, good thing for you to read. Please let me move on. Huh? We'll try and see if we can get the e copy or soft copy. Of okay, please, if they can get this e copy. So, I want to say to you so, when we have fathers, what do we do? We, we, the fathers who pass inheritance to us, they pass their mantles, they pass their prophetic words or their promises, and they pass their mandates. I want to say three things that the fathers will pass to us through fathers. True Father will not use us. True Father will not just manipulate us. True Father will circumcise us, but they will not castrate us. There's a difference between being circumcised and being castrated. True Fathers will not castrate us because they want us to produce. True Fathers will want us to be, to, to be circumcised, but not be castrated. There's a noise. There's a noise coming. And I think... That noise is coming from somebody called David Oluwato. Please, can you switch up your mic? Okay? I want to repeat again that true fathers we give, we release to us. When we follow them and follow, they will release to us their mandates. They will release to us their prophetic or the promise they have, they have inherited. And they will release to us their mantles. That's what they pass on to us. That's what they pass on to us. And we need that. And like I said, God doesn't reproduce. God does not uh, manufacture mantles every day, even not mandate. It's a person. The ministry that John the Baptist has said was the ministry of, uh, uh, of Elijah. And I can tell you, and I just want to show you uh, briefly as I am, I am beginning to uh, wind up. Please go with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. I want to show you it even in the secular way. And then in the spiritual way, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. And then I want to read uh, from uh, verse 20 to make a point. And it says, And Ada Bia Chaba, he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. You see, in other words, the word of God is showing to us that uh, profession, engagement, what we're involved with is usually being fathered. Even though this is an example of Cain, but it's also good to look at it. These are the descendants of Cain. In their mingling and relationship with fallen angels, they became fathers. And that's why you see Ada, Bia Jabba, he was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. Verse 21, and his brother's name was uh, Juba, and was the father of all such as handled the harp and organ. And Sila, she also bear to back to Bakin, an instructor of every artificer in brass, iron, and the sister of Tubakin was uh, Na Nama. So we see there that even these things, these, these uh, occupations, these professions, uh, the scripture is showing that it's being fathered. It's something, it's a generational thing. It's transgenerational thing. It flows down. It flows down. Now, the source from which Cain got it is very wrong, but it just shows a principle. Of course, Satan has nothing but what he steals. But now let's go, the, let's see the godly one. Let's see the godly one. Because right there, in that same chapter, we have the godly one. You see there, and it's in verse 26. And it says, let me read verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said, she had appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Okay? And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So God gave him a new seed and a new generation started. A generation of the people that will follow God. Please come to that chapter 5 and I just show you a 
few things in that chapter 5. And then what happened in chapter 5? As you read it, as you read this genealogy, we come to a man, <clears throat> and he called the man verse 21. Time will not allow me for us to go on, but let's go to verse 21. He say, And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and began and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat, he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Please, verse 24. And Enoch walked with God. And Enoch walked with God. So we see Enoch. So when Enoch was born, a generation started. Father started. They began to father, just like Cain was fathering these people that I've just shown to you in ungodliness, even though it was a, 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 a something that would bring them wealth, but also there's another generation that God has started, a seed that God has started, a fathering process, a generational thing that God started, and we began to see Enoch. Please come to me to... Uh, Genesis chapter 6, and we see a man there who was also an offspring of Enoch, and that is in verse 8. And But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm reading now uh, uh, Genesis chapter 6. I'm reading fast now. There are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah did what? Walk with God. So the same thing. When God started that generation in us, in other words, God is saying, I'm going to raise a people who will work with me. And we began to see that people who work with God, they began to emerge, they began to come out. We saw Enoch and we saw Noah, and then you can trace it down, and then you can be traced to Abraham, and so on and so forth. Then finally, trace to them. I'm just saying that everything God does is generational. Everything Satan does is generational. That's why I said, you have to be mindful of your fathers. Where are you coming from? The carcasses of your kings. So, and you can see this is the reason why for us Gentile, God engrafted us into Abraham. God must engraft you into somebody. Okay, if, you're, if your background is wrong, if you have not been fathered properly, God must engraft you to something. You must be a continuation of somebody. God must bring you into something. That's the process, that's the process of fathering. And we can take this on. I do believe from what I have studied and seen that Enoch, you know, became a father for so many people. I see the ministry of Elijah as a continuation of Enoch's ministry. It's a continuation of Enoch's ministry. That's why Enoch himself, uh, uh, like we have been told, the seventh. So Enoch, so you see this generation, they become, it's a continuation. Uh, Moses is a continuation. Uh, Joshua is a continuation. You see, for me, it began to dawn on me, to clear to me that I, I, I have no other <laughs> ministry is not about personal vision. You must be a continuation of something. What are you a continuation of? That's the question. What are you a continuation of? Okay, that's why the Lord, the, the scripture says, you know, lest I come to smite the earth with a, a curse. It's very, very, very important. And I believe that you and I we must answer the question, am I, what am, I'm a continuation of what? A continuation of war. And that's what I see. If I cry to God, even if my beginning is terrible, like the Bible talks about the beginning of Africans, very terrible. The two people shared that with us. Fuyewa shared that with us. And I think Dr. Ike shared that with us. That's why we must be engrafted. It's a principle. We must be engrafted. We must be engrafted. And God will seek to engraft us. God is seeking to engraft us, to be part of a holy lump. And I must allow myself when God says it's time to be engrafted. And so that God can engraft me to that which is holy, that which is pure, that which is generational, that which is coming from a great, 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 great distance. And this is my understanding. Nobody is, is, a, is a beginning of any new thing, particularly in our generation. We are not a beginning of anything. We must trace our, our spiritual genealogy. God is always tracing spiritual genealogy. When people came back from Babylon, they traced their spiritual genealogy. They know that to know where they coming from. Where are you coming from? And those who those priests who came back from Babylon and they could not trace their genealogy to anywhere, they were stopped from being priests because they couldn't find them. So this is the issue of God saying He will turn the hearts of the Father. May the Lord turn the hearts of the Father to us. First, you will see that uh, this is the, the deep collect onto deep, and then may we be turned 
to our father when the time comes. I'm going to close enough, and I want to just say this last, and I'll, I'll close. One, I want to go to Psalm, uh, Psalm 45. Psalm 45. And I just want to read the portion, Psalm and uh, it's a very, we know that very well. It says, uh, uh, verse 10, Psalm 45, verse 10. It says, Hacking, O daughter, and consider and incline thy ear, forget also thy own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. So we see here, he said, forget your father's house, forget your own people, and be engrafted. And be engrafted. And I want to explain this a little bit. And be engrafted. Please, if you look at, uh, if you are carrying a uh, King James version of the Bible, uh, you, if you look at the, 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 the theme of Psalm 45, you see, to the sheep musician upon Shoshami, for the sons of uh, Korah, Mashil, a song of love. A song of love means a song of commitment. Okay? Now, who are the people who, who wrote this song? It means it was not even David per se. It was the sons of Korah who wrote it. Now, please, let's go back and say who are the sons of Korah. Eh? You will recall that the sons of that the Korah are the people who rebelled against uh, Moses in the wilderness. Please, let's go to Numbers 26. Numbers 26. Numbers 26. And then we will see there the rebellion of uh, Korah and Datan. The description mentioned them. Uh, Numbers 26, and I just want to read from verse 9. I think from verse 9. And it says... And it says here, and the sons of Eliab, Menuel, and Datan, and Abraham. This is that Datan and Abraham, which were famous in the congregation, who strove against Moses and against Aaron in the company, in the leadership of Korah, when they strove against the Lord. Now they strove against the Lord. And the scripture says, first ten, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah. And when that company died, they all died, the earth opened its mouth. What time the, the fire devoured 250 men and they became a sign, a sign for them and a sign forever. A sign for them and a sign forever. Now, notwithstanding, please underline, that's where I'm going, under here. Notwithstanding, the children of Korah died not. Hi, what happened? What happened? Okay, Korah, their father, led the rebellion against Moses, against the Lord in the camp, and God brought down judgment. But why did God spare their children? Why did God spare the children of Korah? Why? That something happened. Something happened. In other words, what the sons of Korah said is this. We will not join the rebellion of our father. We will not be part of rebellion of our father. Our father and his company, they are rebelling against Moses. We will not be part of it. We are not going to join our father. That's the stand they took. That's why they didn't die. That's why they didn't die. You will also see in the scripture that the son, Korah is of the tribe of Levi. But some of them, when they were in Egypt, they attained to position of authority. In fact, we are told, he secularly we say that Korah was a treasurer in, uh, in Egypt. He was a, a government official in Egypt before they were moved out of Egypt. So he was a famous person. He was a man of influence in the congregation. And so he used his position to rebel against Moses. And like we are seeing, the judgment came upon them and they were dealt with. But the sons of Korah, they saw their father 
And they said, no, we are not going to be part of this rebellion of our father. And that's why what happened, time will not permit, they were engrafted. Most, you will see that they served in the kingdom of David. They became part of the kingdom of David. David became, like they were, a father to them. Okay, that's why that scripture in Psalm 45 says, forget your own people and forget your father's house. If your father's house is a house of rebellion, forget it. If your father's house is a house of uh, evil, forget it. I'm being grafted. So that's why the sons of Korah that did not die, they were engrafted into David and they served under David. I can show you this principle again in the scripture. This is crazy, but I think this is one is just enough. And then, so I, I want us to see that you and I will have to make a choice. Arise and shine. The light has come. What is the light? First and foremost is the light of the word of God that will cause us to do. And I want to read again two scriptures, man, I'm going to cry. First Chronicles chapter 9 is the same Quran. I just want to show you uh, First Chronicles chapter uh, I think chapter 9. First Chronicles chapter 9, and I'll read first 19, just to confirm what I just said. First uh, 19, and first 19, I said, Shalom, the son of Korah, the son of Ep. Yes, the gates of the tabernacle, their fathers being over the host of the law, were keepers of the entry. That was their job. And you see, they are Phineas. And Phineas, the son of, we know Phineas for what he did for his stand, and so on and so forth. So you will see there. And if you go, you can also read further, first 31, and the first, uh, I think, first 31. Uh, and first one, that one said, and uh, Mati, Matitia, one of the Levites, who was a firstborn of Shalom, Shalom the Korah, the Kohat, and the said office over the things that were made in the pan. So that was their office, that was their position, and then, but they rebelled. And, but the scripture saw that their children did not die because their children did not join them. Finally, Jude chapter, Jude is the last, is the one, is the one, uh, just a chapter. Let me read. In the New Testament, we are told they are seen. Uh, Jude, and I'll read first 10 and 11. Jude first 10 and 11, I say, Jude first 10 and 11, say, but they speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally. Please don't speak only what you know naturally. Don't speak without discernment. Don't speak without understanding. Okay? It is, it is evil in the house of God to speak from the natural knowledge, comment on the natural, react on the natural knowledge uh, based on your sentiment and emotion. He said, but they speak evil of those things which they do not know, which do not have discernment and understanding and revelation, but what they know naturally. And as brute peace. When people do like that, they are like brute peace. In those things, they corrupt themselves. What a corruption. And then he say, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perish in the gainsaying of Kor or Kore, which is talking about Kora. So we see there, what was the scene? Of their father, Gensin. They spoke in the natural. They look at Moses in the natural. They talk about Moses in the natural. They said things they did not understand about Moses in the natural. They find excuse, and maybe a genuine excuse in those they spoke to, and they were dealt with. But my joy is that they found that their sons or their children refused to join them in their rebellion, and they were engrafted into David. And there are so many other things one can say about that, but I'm close now. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to share with you.
uh, across Nigeria, South Africa, Europe, America. I know, like I said in the beginning, I've spoken to some of some of you are very young people in your in your in your very young uh, bracket. Some of you are just on up to twenty. Some of you are in your twenty. Some of you young adults. I know parents were there too, and so on and so forth. I want to thank you, and I bless the Lord for giving us the opportunity to offer this meeting. And uh, the way God has spoken to us, the way God has blessed us, and I do trust that um, the Lord will come and bear and see the fruits that this will bring forth into His kingdom. I do speak to your life that you will arise, you will shine, that you will embrace the light, and because your light has Amen. come, and the glory of the Lord will be risen upon you. Amen. Amen. And in this last day, we'll become part of that army. The army of the Lord Amen. that will go Amen. and do great exploit for Him. That will change Africa. Amen. That will change the history of the black race. Amen. That Amen. will be the people who will Amen. see this move of God. Amen. This last the move of God that will go forth Amen. and change Amen. the history of Africa and change also many Amen. people from their terrible beginning. Amen. That will be carrying the glory of the Lord in this last day. I speak Amen. to you, arise and shine. I speak Amen. to your spirit, arise and shine. I speak to your soul, arise and shine. Uh, that you will no longer be in darkness. You will not be shut down. You will not be. You will not be being captivity to anything. I speak liberty. I speak release. I speak the glory of God upon your life. I speak that the light of God will shine upon your path. I speak that you will fulfill your purpose. Yes, in the name of Yahusha, my share. I speak the blessing of the Lord upon you. I please the name of the Yahuwah, our Father, over your lives. That that will be your guide, that will be your shield, that will be your help. That indeed, our Father will see the travail of his soul and he will be satisfied. That we will arise to be sons and daughters. We will arise to walk in intimacy with our Father. Never before, there will be a generation that will fulfill prophecies, that will fulfill the word of the Lord. There will be a generation that will receive the mantles that will receive the mandate, that will receive the prophecy that has been spoken. Yes, because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And we do thank the Lord. I thank you for those of you who have organized it, Lola and your team. The Lord bless you. Thank you, Pastor Baba Jide from, uh, from South Africa. Thank you for the part, for your sacrifice and support. And so many of you uh, who have really labor, who have put in so much for this to become a reality, you will not lose your reward. Uh, mm -hmm. That comes from the Father. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much, sir. Wow. So, that was a very powerful session. Thank you very much, Daddy, for bringing that word from the heart of the Father and from your heart to us. Uh, the word of the Lord is new every morning. That's, that's again the, the impact again of the word you brought. It's new. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's new. And, and, it, and it's fresh. And the impact is uh, it's, it's gone. And, and, I, know, and we are, I know we are blessed. I know we are challenged again. Uh, quickly, anybody with any question or comment? Question, comment? Let's take a question. Um, sir, I think I have a question. Okay. Um, thank you so much, sir. Um, I was truly blessed and with an eye opener for mm. me. Um, so um, there's something that struck me. Um, it was what, what she said about um, Elisha you know, having the heart to become a prophet as again, being a son. And, you know, there's this question I've always asked, like, um, why some of children were not like him? You know, and also why Eli's children ended up the, um, the way they did? You know, it was always of great concern to me. You know, but so my question is, how can one really, um, one, purge themselves? And then, you know, have that heart. And then you said, you mentioned that 
um, the Lord told you to, to vomit all that you had learned. You know, what are the steps one could take to actually vomit, you know, all that? Because, you know, some, some situations that just came not, like, we, we didn't choose them. Like, the families we came from, we didn't choose them. The places we've been, you know, we just found ourselves there. You know, so but how can we um, actively, you know, you know, forge ourselves? So that's okay. the question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, the let me start with the Eli. Uh, it's a long story. Eli himself was coming from a place, uh, a, a place, a very long history. And uh, what happened to Ella is unfortunate that it can happen to any one of us. And that's part of what we are sharing today, where you come from, with your father. And of course, like you said, I did not choose my father, I did not choose my village, I did not choose what, and that's true. But the, the important thing is that even in that, if, my, if, I, if, uh, if uh, the Lord give me opportunity to correct, and to, to have a choice to change myself. Uh, Yoruba people say, when they give back to you, you should also give back to yourself. And because, uh, you know, the scripture talks about the Moab, that Moab has been at ease from his youth because he was born in, in, through a last, uh, in sensuous relationship, but that was not enough excuse for him to continue in it. So, yeah, I must recognize where I'm coming from. Uh, my background, the failure, and things like that. But when God gives me opportunity to be engrafted, I should grab it with all my hands. And I think that's where the problem is. There's none of us that God will not give opportunity to be changed, to be engrafted to something else. But are we willing to grab it with all our hands and really allow for that total change to be grafted into an, another olive tree that is holy? And that's the will of God. And it takes a process. And that's what I, I think, uh, what I have uh, found that helped me is that uh, when I was asking the Lord, why did you send me to Pyotin to father me? Ah, there are so many other people I've met in my journey with you. And he said those ones, they were my helpers. They helped me on my way to journey to sonship. And, uh, but one thing that God has helped me, anytime God send anybody into my way, I, I, I consider it a blessing and I, and I grab it with all my hands. I learned what they had to learn from them. I, there was a time, I can say for instance that, uh, let me give you an instance, there was a time in my life that uh, kind of taking books were my food. I, I bought almost any book that uh, came out from there, kind of taking, I read it, I chew it, I carry it, I put it in my book, I, everywhere. <laughs> and I learned that from uh, kind of taking himself. He said, one of the persons he followed in his life was uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth. That he read Smith Wigglesworth's book, he kept his book, he slept with it, he ate it, he chewed it. He did. And then the ministry of uh, Smith Wigglesworth came out of him. You see, he, he, we, must, we must see when God sent a book, a person, somebody to us, we must know and recognize and grab it. Can I take him could have read it and say, well, that was the day of uh, Smith Wigglesworth, who knows? You know? But it's something in him say, grab it, take it, shoot it, do everything. And it changed him, changed his life, changed everything. So grab whatever God has given to you. It's part of your journey. Don't be lazy about it. Don't be lackadaisical. Don't treat it with levity. Some people, when they are even given books, they don't read it. They just drop it somewhere. So yes, God knows where I'm coming from. And like I said to you, one of the things the Lord said to me then is that, you need to spend time to be with me. It is in the place of uh, being with me, waiting upon me, seeking my face, that I will do the project. And God did it in many ways. He will speak to me. He will show me things in the place of waiting. And maybe one way or the other, somewhere, a book will land in my hand. Somebody will send me a book or I will come out, that will be confirming what the Lord has spoken to me in the secret. So that's where the project comes. I, God spoke to me things that... Uh, I remember, for instance, I remember that there was somebody, uh, this man, the, this astronaut, uh, what is his name now, that first step into the, into the moon, he wrote, he wrote a book there. Uh, what is his name now? Armstrong. Armstrong, yes. He wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Christ Must Come Back in 1988. 
somebody goes give me that book and i read the book and uh, but by the time i read the book the, the it was uh, the prophecy was not fulfilled because it was beyond 88 and i went to the last said lord this man read this uh, wrote this book calculated everything that you are, that you are supposed to come in 1988 september 1988 why is it that you didn't come in september 1988 and the lord said to me well what he wrote is true and what he wrote is is okay but he didn't understand that that coming was a secret coming what i meant then is that he said because rapture will happen yes he said rapture will happen 1988 and i said Lord, why is it that the rapture didn't happen 1988 as this man wrote and the Lord said, actually, rapture started in 1988. I said, what kind of rapture? And the Lord said to me, for instance, you, I call you out of denomination. That's a form of a rapture. You have been, I called you out. And then I said, eh, can this be true? Will this be God? Is God speaking to me? I'm just hearing myself. And then I think a few days after that, there was a meeting somewhere in Yaba, and a brother placed some more, uh, who wrote uh, non dare call it deception, and the uh, Dusil, who wrote uh, the book on pattern, they came to Nigeria to hold a meeting. And I went that morning, and as I sat in that meeting, when it was the turn of uh, Brackley Samoa to speak, the first thing he said, he said, there's a move of God that started in 1988. It's a still small voice. He was preaching from that scripture that said there was an earthquake, there was fire, but the Lord was in the still small voice. And he said, this move of God is still small for it started in 1988. I was like jumping out of my seat. I said, wow, that's what the Lord said to me where I was waiting after reading that book. You know, I'm just showing to you how God speaks to us when we wait before him. And then I had further confirmation. Other people, I think uh, there's another man who also came. Uh, I think uh, um, can I think also purpose, plan, and something like that. It also was, it says, in 1998. Benny, he also spoke there and said in 1998. So I had about three confirmation of what God spoke to me in the secrecy of, of my waiting. So I'm just explaining to, so to wait before God, to, to spend time with God, that's where we are changed, that's where we are transformed, that's God, where God will teach us deep things. And we can't be changed, we can't be transformed if we don't have time. That's what the Lord is asking, intimacy, intimacy, intimacy with Him. That's the Father. That's where we know His heart. And that's where we follow him. So that, that's what I would recommend. That's where I, the Lord helped me. That's where I journey with the Lord. And then you talk about uh, Eli and the Samuel. Well, you, you, there are two different things here. You will see that Eli was con completely not in charge. He didn't talk to his children. He didn't rebook his children. He just left them to do whatever they wanted to do. And that's why God charged him. But if you look at Samuel, Samuel was different. Samuel was not charged by God. It was not an issue with God, uh, with God about Samuel. Why? Because Samuel told his students, stood the, uh, to speak the truth to his children. And so God couldn't uh, put him in the same category with Eli. And I've always said to the parents, do your part. You can, you can, children will be what they want to be, but you do your part. Make sure you take your stand. Make sure you did the right thing. Don't pamper. Stand with God. Let your children know that you will stand with God. Let your children know that you will not uh, pamper them beyond measure. You will love them, you will care for them, but the greatest love you can do for them is to stand for them and stand with God so that they can know where you stand. And I think that's what Samuel did. And that's why Samuel was not child. That's why Samuel was not put in the same category like Eli. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Sir. Any other question? Yes, sir. I please have a question. Okay. Okay. Um. Thank you. Uh, um. Thank you, sir, for sharing all that you um did. It really hit me. Um. Yeah, it really hit a an, an nail for me, sir. Okay. So um, I want to refer to Psalm forty-five, verse ten, um, which you referred to, sir. It speaks about forgetting thine own people and thy father's house. Um, mm -hmm. if I understood correctly, you spoke of that in terms of um, forgetting what one was taught by by or what one was taught in one's father's house. Um, are there other ways that one can work out in forgetting one's own people and one's father's house? I hope I'm making sense, sir. Yeah, you do. It's a good question. Uh, I will say that both in the natural and uh, maybe spiritually or religiously. And what I mean by that, and that's what I've been talking about 
the carcasses of our kings, the, the fathers who have not taught us, our fathers who have always resisted the Holy Spirit and they have not followed, and they are uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in their ears and so on and so forth. And I, I'm just saying that a time comes when the Lord will say to you, it's time, both emotionally, spiritually, and sometimes physically to leave your father's house. Very, very important. Both emotionally, spiritually, and sometimes physically to leave your father's house. It's part of the price you pay to follow the Lord. So, but nobody's going to say, you leave. It will be a dealing of God at the right time, when the time comes. Uh, I remember when I met Pastor, and then he said to me, after I shared with him, he came to the congregation where I was pastoring, and he said to me, please promise me that you will not leave this congregation until this time. And he said, it's even a covenant. He said, I should make a covenant with him that I will not leave. And I said, yes, I will not leave. He said, please don't leave prematurely, but the time will come. From what God is saying to you, I say to you, God will move you out. But don't do it prematurely. Wait for it. When the time comes, you will know. And he said that even when, when the time comes and you choose not to leave, they will push you out. And that's what uh, happened. When the time came for me to go, I knew. The Lord told me clearly, express, but that, by that time, by that time, I had gone to be with the Lord. I knew expressly that it's time to go. So uh, I'm not advocating that you should do it prematurely. I'm not saying you should do it. But if you follow God, God will tell you. You will know. And there will be witnesses around you. That's why you should have people you share with. That's why people you have people you fellowship. You can also confirm the dealing of God in your life. And it's, it's important. Uh, very, very important. And uh, maybe I also say, even in my own physical, my physical family, uh, it came a time where the Lord said to me, because I felt that, well, since I was born there, I am entitled to, to inherit some things. And they gave me family land. They were, you know, they gave me family land and beyond family land, money and things like that. And at the time, the Lord said, please don't take this money again. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't obey until God dealt with me and disciplined me. And that's part of it. I'm glad when God disciplines me because it's just that I'm a son, I'm not a pastor. And then, uh, and then the Lord said to me, even the land they gave to you, I'd, I'd already fenced it and I wanted to, to build a house there. And the Lord said, please go and return the land to them. I'm your exceeding great reward. You don't need land from your father's house. Go and give it back to them. It was not easy, but I had to go back and say, please, I don't want this land again. I don't want it. That's part of living your father's house. And it's a process. It's not a one, one, one time thing. It's something that continues. But, and that's why we call about journey and journey and journey and journey. It's just, you are, if, if your heart is touched and you want to really grow in your sonship, you are really to sacrifice anything, anything and everything. Just to, just, just to follow the Lord. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. So any, any more? Okay, I think uh, I think we don't have any other question. Uh, I do. Okay, I'm talking fellow. Yes. Okay, please. I'll be quick. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, when Daddy was sharing the other time, he said his um, mantle is passed on, you know, that is not created, that is passed on to, to the son, Abi. So and I want to ask, in the case of Elijah and Elisha, yes, mm. it was only yes. Elisha that Elijah passed on the mantle to and then you're in our own case our fathers have many sons or many children is it the same mantle they are passing on to the sons, or they have different things different people will take from their fathers okay thank you good question uh yes you will see that uh like, yeah, it's true that God doesn't create uh, mantles here and there. Uh, he has created mantles that many of them. In fact, some people that God has taken to heaven, they have seen the room. God opened the door and showed them these are mantles. And uh, it's, uh, some. And then uh, I've read a book, uh, the Lord took a man to the stores in heaven. And he said one of the stores God showed him is the mantle that some people lost. God gave them mantles, but they didn't work with God, and they allow enemy to steal the mantle. 
and it's locked up. Sit and lock it up. And then the, that brother said, go shoot him. And God was saying that it will take a generation who understand the will of God to, to take those mantles back from the enemy. You see, when God gives a mantle to man, if he doesn't carry it away, even the enemy can steal it and take it away from him. And so God doesn't really, really create a new mantle. He just gives us the one and we we'll work with. Uh, particularly if we have been engrafted into a person, into a house, into a family, into a tribe. I'm talking spiritually now. So, because for instance, in a house, there can be fathers. There can be four, five fathers or hundred fathers. Just like in a tribe, there are fathers. So if you belong to a house, there may not be one just father. <laughs> you know, there may be many fathers and for that house, for that tribe, for that movement. That may be. So we need to see it that way. But then speaking specifically, you will see that uh, uh, mantle is not easily given. Even when uh, Elisha said, that it's your mantle, your double portion. Now, of course, if you follow a man, God doesn't just give you. You are entitled to have a double portion of the man. But it does, it's not automatic. It's not very, very automatic. It depends. And there are people who follow people and they will never be given the mantle because they didn't follow properly. It's not, it's not automatic. Look, in the case of uh, Elisha, it was given the double portion. It was given to him because he followed faithfully, he saw. But like I said, he saw too, he saw too, early, too late, too late rather. And then uh, if you look at uh, John the Baptist, it was the same. In fact, that is expressly spoken in the scripture, both in Matthew chapter 17 and Luke chapter 1, verse 17, that the mantle, it is the spirit of the mantle of the anointing of Elijah that was given to John the Baptist. And then you could see, it's only a portion of it that was given to John the Baptist, not the fullness of it. Because John the Baptist, the Bible says he did not perform any miracle. He didn't perform any miracle. But what is the aspect that was given to John the Baptist? It's to prepare the people of, of the Lord. If you go to that, uh, uh, let me read that. Uh, the portion that was given to you, to John the Baptist is uh, recorded for us in, I think, in Matthew 17. Let me read it that. So that means you can just get a part of the mantle. It may not be the fullness of the mantle, depending on your, on your, on you, and depending on how you have worked with God. God may just take a part of it and give it to you. Now, I'm reading from uh, Matthew chapter 17. Uh, I think uh, it's the disciple who say, first 10, and the disciple asked him, saying, Why then say the scribe that the last must come, must first come? And Jesus answered, Sorry, and said unto them, The last truly shall, uh, truly shall first uh, come and restore all things. But I say unto you that the last is already is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise, shall uh, also the Son of Man uh, suffer of death. In other words, they will not recognize the Son of the same way. He said they did not even know. Even though John the Baptist gave them a clue, the voice of him that's crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, as spoken by Isaiah, but they didn't recognize him. They called him all kinds of names. Then we are told that uh, in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, Luke chapter 1, verse 17 says, and he shall go before him, in the spirit and power of Elijah, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepare for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, wherefore are we? No, I think that's all. Now, so you see the portion that was given to John the Baptist was just to prepare a people for the first coming of our, our Savior, Husha Mashiach, to prepare the way for him. So he was given a portion. He never did any miracle. Because at that time, it was not necessary. He just given a portion. So you may not be given the fullness of the, depending on your assignment, the price you are paid, your location, what you are doing, it depends. So uh, I want the best. So I will ask you to strive for the best, to get the fullness of the mantle. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank I'm you, sir. Best, and I'm going to get the best. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> for your time again. And, uh, Amen. We can't. We can't over thank you, and then um, for uh, the hearts of, of the Father that uh, you have demonstrated over the years, model for us, 
we, we are grateful that the Lord has raised you as a pattern for us in our generation uh, and then for Africa. And uh, we, we just want to say thank you for ministering the heart of the Father to us. Um, we do trust that the Lord will keep you for us the longer you are doing Amen. this and you are your time in strength, in glory, in energy for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Daddy. Thank uh, you. I also want to thank all the Father of the house. I want to thank uh, Baba Aladdin from the UK. Amen. Thank you for your presence, sir. We really appreciate Amen. you too. Uh, thank you for your blessing. Amen. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for the way the Lord has used you to play in our life. We, we also pray the same prayer for you so that the Lord will keep you and the Lord will prolong your days. Amen. Glory and strength for you. But we still need you. We need your wisdom. We need Amen. You. Amen. Amen. The Lord have a blessing for Amen. 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 Thank you to Uncle Wiki. Um, thank you very much, sir. Your your standing with us has been very encouraging. Right from the beginning of the conference. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Uh, I actually you. had no choice. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> thank you, Uncle. We thank you. We thank you, Uncle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benga. Yes, sir. <laughs> thank you very much. Sir. Uh, thank, thank you. you um, Thank you, Auntie Aikena from Ireland. You've been very supportive also. I hope you are still there. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Okay, I can see you. Thank you for your support. Uh, thank you, Auntie Aikena Lutu. You've been very supportive. Thank you for your stand and your participation. Thank you, Daddy Oladi I can see you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for also being there for us. Uh, we are a very blessed generation. We are. Amen. Who have legacy and work with God, uh, who have journey with the Lord. Uh, so we thank you also, uh, Pastor Moses. He's also a father in the house. Thank you. I hope you can hear me, sir. Okay, I can see you. Uh, your testimony was really a blessing. Listen to you this morning. I, I thought I knew you, but <laughs> listening to your uh, your life experience today, like ah. I've never had this part before. So you it was quite a blessing. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, all the other aunties and uncles in the house. Uh, Auntie Uwachile Melu, yes. Thank you. Uh, you you've been there secretly, but I I saw you. I don't know if you are still there. Thank you very much, ma, for uh, coming to be part of the conference. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks also go to our brothers from um, South Africa, I mean from Cape Town and uh, from Free State. Thank you, Sister Tinswalo, uh, for being there from right right from the beginning of the conference to the end. Uh, we ask that the Lord will bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, um, always again, I'm going to thank a very big thanks go to the team. Okay, the planning team. I'm, I'm not a one man squad. Uh, I'll start again from Pastor Moses uh, as part of the team. Thank you for your input. Thank you, Brio. Brashile Brio from Pretoria. Uh, you are part of the team and you've been there also from the beginning of the conference. Yes support you're very supportive whereas that the lord will bless you uh, some of the right talk you saw in the email came from the team some came from rio rastomosi sister root so we thank all of you who are, who are part of the who are part of the planning team pastor moses sister root Shile Kwayo, and the team that work with me here in nigeria okay um actually from the technical team some of you may not know may not see him on the video but daniel has been very, very fantastic. It's been wonderful. We've been working together from Wednesday. <laughs> we work from morning till evening. So a big thank you to you, Brad Daniel. Uh, God will bless you and your team, Brad John. Uh, praise, praise John. God bless you. Uh, and all of us who have taken our time uh, to participate in, in this conference, I've been there from, the, from Atlanta, 
again, the Lord bless you. Ratosin. If I don't mention your name, uh, never mind. We appreciate all of you. We thank you. I will trust that the Lord will bless all of us again and again. And I will grow in the strength of the word of God that, uh, that we have had, the seed that have been sown into us will germinate and will bring forth fruit. Thank you, Bridewood. I remember Bridewood from Ife. Thank you for your support and your prayers. Prayers that the Lord will bless you. Um, just before we go, um, I want to announce to us a very big, interesting announcement. Very, very interesting. Some people are clapping their hands, okay? So you can start clapping your hands. <laughs> okay, so we are going to have another conference in December. Another virtual conference. I don't know if you are excited. Me, I'm excited. Yay. <laughs> yes, I am. So we're going to have another virtual conference uh, like this in December. Uh, we've been planning to have it look, I mean, physically in Nigeria, but um, from what God is saying to us and what we're seeing, we have decided that we're going to make it live uh, or a virtual so that those who are in, in diaspora and different parts of the world can join. Uh, so the conference is coming up between 24th to 26th of December. 24th to 26th December. Please lock down that date. And we want to announce to you to start registration now. The registration portal is ready and it's open. If you go to plummetyouth.org, plummetyouth.org. So please start the registration now so that um, we can uh, hit the ground running in good time. Let's uh, tell our friends in school, let's tell our friends in our neighborhood, let's tell our friends in our place of work and relationship, uh, where we work, where we do business, uh, to participate in this uh, coming conference. December is here, so we are almost away. I mean, we are almost through with uh, September. By next week now, will be third week in September. So we only have October. November. So good two months and the first two weeks in December. So don't think it's still very far. So please start the registration, start the publicity. We trust that uh, the one in December will be more robust. We have you know, uh, a whole lot of people coming on to, again, hear the word of the Lord. We are living at a very strategic time. Uh, like we know that God is saying, Africa is your time. Your people is our time. From what Brown uh, Quickie shared with us, we know that the majority of the population of Africa is, is youth. So when God is saying, Africa, your time, indirectly, God is saying, young people in Africa, it's your time. Because 70% of the population of Africa is young people. I mean, average is about 20, 19 point something. So God is saying, young people, it's your time. So I'm excited again that we're going to have another opportunity uh, in December. Um, God will be blessing us through uh, different ministers of God, fathers in the house. I will trust that uh, it will be more robust than this one and that the lord is going to bless us massively so please let's lock up uh, that day like i said and let's keep regis uh, registration you can see on the screen now that's the that's a screenshot that's the team there that kingdom come okay walking in the wisdom of the times and season okay and you can you can agree with me that we have fathers in the house who are who are who are, who are, who are, who are full of wisdom so like i like i said in the beginning we need the wisdom of the father and the strength of the youth so, uh, you, are not going to, you can't afford to miss this coming conference. One, two, one, zero, two days, 15 hours, 59 minutes, 20 seconds to go. So, uh, as we go, once again, as the Lord will bless us, enjoy your remaining part of your weekend. It was the beginning of the, I mean, okay, it's, it's still weekend. So, uh, please, let's go to, let's go back to the uh, recorded sessions. In the, in the link that will be sent to us in our email to listen to some of the messages again. Some of us have seen us, we're coming in for the first time. Please endeavor to register so you can have access to the replace, the recorded replace session on uh, YouTube. For those of us who are challenged with data, we are going to try, we are not making a promise, but we'll try and uh, see if we can extract the audio so that you can have access to the audio. But those of us who have data and not data, please go to the YouTube channel, subscribe to it, watch the session again and i'm sure you will be blessed again and again so thank you once again everyone for coming the lord bless us see you in december 24 to 26 bye bye, bye. bye.
Bye-bye. Congratulations. Bye-bye. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, sir. Bye. Bye-bye. Someone is registering for you are singing over me. You've been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me Only overwhelming ever Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah, yeah. When I was your fault, still your love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no words, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, endless of a God. Oh, it chases me down, fights me Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't sit down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't sit down, coming after me. Oh, the 
is the God. Oh, it chases me down, fights me around, from me is the ninety-nine. I could earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending presence. Where?